Douglas Murray, so glad to have you. I'm so used to talking to you on the weekends. Here I get to dive in long form with you about your new book, War on the West, How to Prevail in the Age of Unreason. Man, you are one of the most insightful minds that I've come across in the last several years. It is standard practice for me to butter up my guest right out of the gate. But I mean it this time, Douglas. I don't give gratuitous compliments. I mean it. You are a unique and important mind today. Let's talk about your book, but let's start with setting the terms. Tell me first, what is the West? Well, first of all, well, it's a great pleasure to be with you, and thank you. I'm really pleased to have this opportunity to talk at greater length uh, about these issues. The West uh, is, of course, in one way, a very straightforward thing to define. In another way, you could spend all day debating it. Uh, I try not to get into that. I'm not writing a history of the West. I am writing a defense of the West, and you're quite right, we should define the terms. Uh, the West, as I said, is the, uh, the Western democracies, the products of Western civilization, uh, Britain, Europe, America, the Anglosphere, that is Canada, Australia, New Zealand. These are the countries we would regard as being Western. It's not just a geographical expression. It started as a geographical expression, but obviously, as I say, there are countries like Australia, New Zealand, and and others, which you would you would definitely add into it. They are more obviously Western, they are Western style democracies with the system of rights and and uh, and much more that we have. And they're descended from the same well of ideas, including religious ideas, philosophical ideas, democratic ideas. Uh, so so the West is um, is a a very broad term for um, a system and a, a culture and a civilization which, uh, even if people don't think they could identify it, I can assure them they can if they go anywhere else. In other words, um, you know that when you're in China that you're not in the West. Uh, you know when you're in Japan, you're in a very interesting, very rich culture, but it's not the West. Uh, you know in Africa, it's Africa, but it's not the West. So it, it, it is clear it's... Um, certainly obvious when you see it. And I'd argue it's obvious when you're not in it. Uh, so yes, it's a pretty broad definition, but you've got to start somewhere. And I want to come back to that somewhere in just a moment. I want to talk more about what exactly encompasses the West. But first, as we sort of lay the foundation of this conversation, mm. now tell me exactly what is the war? The war is uh, what I describe in the opening as a war of all of the foundations of the West. Uh, the foundations of the West include the historical foundations of the West, our history that's being trashed, destroyed, taken away from us, sometimes quite literally, on a daily basis in America and the rest of the West. It's an assault on the peoples of the West. Uh, in an era where we regard racism, quite rightly, as one of the great human evils, uh, the one racism that is permissible, the one that is indeed encouraged, is racism against the peoples of the West, who, historically speaking, and it's not a, uh, a anything other than an observation of fact, have been white people, not the only people in the West, but the majorities, certainly. Uh, there is a war going on against these people, uh, against us, against the people who are form the majority in the West. Uh, if you wanted to have a, for some reason, you decided you wanted to war on Africa, you would war on the black people who make up the majority in Africa. Well, if you war on the West, you war on the white people who make up the majority in the West. And uh, that process, which I describe, is one of the ugliest things going on in our day, and one of the most vicious. Uh, but there's also a war on our, all, of our, all of our traditions in the West. A war on the religious foundations of the West. And by that, I don't just mean the Judeo-Christian religion, which is so important to the West, but also the philosophical tradition stretching back thousands of years from ancient Greece and in more recent centuries to the Enlightenment philosophers. Our secular traditions, which were so important to the founding fathers in America, these also have been taken away, described also as racist, colonialist, and much more. Uh, and then you get to the attack on the culture of the West. So that everything in the cultural inheritance that we have is also treated through the same very, very narrow ideological prism. And that prism, as I've just given a bit of it away, is always the same. A particular recent ideological prism 
which sees everything in the West only through the lens of racism, slavery, and colonialism. Uh, these now are taken not just through our politics, but through our culture, so that every cultural institution, from uh, soccer teams uh, to art galleries, all have the same political ideology being used to wage war against them. Waging war against the culture, against religion, against philosophy, against history. But who mm. is waging the war? I hear you. It's being uh, waged through the prism of race. Who is waging the war? Uh, so several groups of people. Uh, one I just, are the people who describe themselves now as anti-racist. I abhor their use of this term because, of course, if you call yourself an anti-racist, it suggests that you're against racism. But people who call themselves anti-racist at the moment are actually the only legitimately racist people in our societies. If you call yourself an anti-racist, you can be as racist as you like. And the people I quote in the book who do that are unbelievable in the things they say. People like Ibram X. Kendi, Robin DiAngelo, these people calling themselves anti-racists are actually, of course, engaged in appalling racism. But that is a movement in our time. People who say that we must only understand America through the lens of race and that uh, uh, America, for instance, has been racist from the, from the beginning, that is born in racism. These claims are much more. These are, these are particular ideological actors. As I say early in the war on the West, these people talk about justice and really they're talking about revenge. Uh, they're not really talking about justice. Then there are others, and I'll just quickly mention one group, which is uh, Marxist. Uh, they haven't gone away, you know. Uh, the Marxists are still there, and you can see their intentions in the fact that they attack every historical figure who has ever said anything bad in history, with one exception, which is Karl Marx, who, as I say in one very enjoyable passage in The War in the West, if I say so myself, I show how incredibly racist Marx was. He uses the N-word all the time, uses Jew as an attack term, uh, has horrible views on slavery and empire. I guess everything wrong, never mind his own theories. Uh, I quote all these passages in the book and I say, well, that's very interesting. Why are the, Mar why are the Marxists not, not uh, doing to Marx what they've done to Thomas Jefferson, Winston Churchill, Abraham Lincoln? And uh, it's been great fun since the book came out. And this has got more publicity, more attention, the issue of Marx's racism. Uh, the number of Marxists have come out of the woodwork and they say, Douglas is being very unfair. And I say, oh, yeah, what, how? And they say, Marx was simply a man of his time. Yeah. Oh like everyone as else. Right. And as uh, then they, some of them have said, well, he, we, we don't look to Marx for his, his uh, personal prejudices. We look to him for his views on economics. And you think, well, what do you think we were doing with the founding fathers and all the presidents and all of our heroes? And what do you think we were going to them for? So there is also, and I just mentioned that one quickly, there is also a Marxist component of people who, who's, who have, for the last 200 years, said the answer to everything is, is Marxism. They're doing it again now. And some of it is totally open. Some of it's a bit more discreet. But that's also definitely a movement in our time, driving the anti-Westernism, driving the anti-Americanism. Okay, so a war as exhibited by the vilification and cancellation of Western history, philosophy, mm -hmm. and culture, religion, and absolute underpinnings of Western civilization committed yeah. by anti-racists and Marxists against the targeted West, as you defined it, largely driven or at least simplified by some conception of the Anglosphere. Now, mm. you've said so many things that I want to follow up on. I want to talk about revenge versus justice. I want to talk about mm. Karl Marx and his racism. And through the course of the next half hour or so, I promise to do my best to peel back every one of those layers mm. of the onion. But now I want to ask you, I want to start with our original term, the West. You defined it largely as the Anglosphere. Mm. Great Britain, its colonies, America, Canada, and Australia. And the attack specifically on the philosophies, traditions, and history of those civilizations. Mm. The secondary title to your book actually leads me to this question. You talk about war on the West prevailing in the age of unreason. I've thought a lot about mm. this, Douglas, and I've thought about this anti-racist movement and mm. the way it attacks such fundamental foundational principles of so much that for me it seems even bigger than what mm. we would call the west or at least the way i think you defined the west you did touch on this 
the tradition going back to the Greeks of depending upon reason and rationality. It seems to mm. me in a lot of ways, what we're actually talking about is the enlightenment, is the foundation wow. of what ended up being Western civilization. And in that way, wouldn't the war be not just against Britons and Canadians and Australians and Americans, mm. but it would also be against Italians and Spanish and any oh, yes. civilization that built its foundation on the Enlightenment. Yes, absolutely. You're quite right. Um, as I say, I mean, I sort of highlight the Anglosphere countries, the Anglophone countries, uh, because it, it, what I'm describing is actually a lot worse here. I mean, I should stress there are lots of different types of anti-Westernism. There's Arab anti-Westernism, there's Chinese anti-Westernism. What I'm particularly focused on is Western anti-Westernism, the movement within the West to tear down the West. The people primar done primarily by people of the West, you know, including very prominently white people in the West waging war on the thing that they've inherited. Um, but... I mention that because it's very important to, to, to recognize where it's worst. It's worst in America, and it's second most worst in all the countries which are English speaking because they imbibe American culture so much. They imbibe it a lot more than France or Spain or Italy does, uh, for better or for worse. On this occasion, you know, it's for worse when people managed to download the American virus here. So it's, you know, it's, you get movements like BLM, like the so-called anti-racist, you get them first in other English speaking countries, you know, in Canada, in Britain. It's in these places that they basically replay American viruses uh, in their own uh, tone. Other countries have got versions of this, France has, but it's noticeable that there is also a pushback against it from a very high level. No less a figure than the, than the president of uh, the Republic of France, Emmanuel Macron, has said in the last couple of years, we must not import this American wokeness. Wokeness, I don't particularly like the thing. I think it's too frivolous for what I'm really talking about here, which is a very much deeper um, uh, strata of argument and war against us. But Macron says we can't afford in France to download this American virus, you know. So other countries that are not English speaking are better at protecting themselves, it seems to me. Most dangerous is America. Most dangerous are the countries immediately affected by America. Yeah, I've heard you say America is a net exporter of this woke ideology. Yes. And I like that you say that the term woke almost does a disservice to the conversation we're having because yes. what we're having is much deeper and more important mm. than the sort mm. of trendy terminology of wokeism. Um, yeah. I want to talk about comparative sin for just one moment, and I'm going to try mm. to leave no string dangling here. But you've talked about mm. this, um, and this is sort of why I went to the age of the Enlightenment, because Spain obviously was a big participant in the Atlantic slave trade. I believe yes. the Portuguese were really one of the yes. you know underpinnings the of the yeah. Atlantic yeah. slave trade. And if you look at the number of slaves mm. that were traded to Brazil, a Portuguese cannot colony versus the number of yeah. slaves traded to America, an English colony, it pales mm. in comparison. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's very, um, and very strange that Brazil doesn't, uh, it doesn't have people saying that Brazil, seriously, that Brazil should tear itself apart, destroy its history and pay reparations to right. pay for its slave trade. I mean, it's very So weird. why is that, Douglas? We, we, you know, and that's why I went back to the Enlightenment. You don't mm. see this movement in Spain. You don't see it in France. You don't see it in mm. Italy. You don't see it in other countries who are mm. the inheritees of the Enlightenment. You see it in the English-speaking sphere. Why? Well, well, I believe that it's because we've got our own history in the West uniquely out of proportion uniquely in America. America is particularly bad in understanding not just its own history, but the context of its own history. Let me explain what I mean. As far as I know, America is the only country which at the moment in the developed world has a serious dispute about when it was founded. This isn't happening even in Britain. It's not happening in uh, France. It's not happening in Spain. Right? It's America that is having a serious dispute caused by its alleged paper of record, the New York Times, about when the, when the Republic of America should be regarded as having started. Should we say that it was started by the founders or should we say that it was founded when the first slaves came into the American continent in 1619? Well, a significant number of Americans uh, believe that we should do that latter, take that latter course, that 
that that 1619 is more important than 1776, and that we should um, regard America as being born into this original sin. Now, I'm afraid that a lot of Americans have fallen for this. A lot of Americans, particularly young Americans, have fallen for this. They don't know about the slave trade that Brazil was engaged in. They don't know it was going on much longer than the American slave trade, that Brazil was still slave trading into the 1880s. They don't know that what America was doing in having slavery was what every civilization in history had done up till then, what everyone was still doing. They don't know that during the same time that the transatlantic slave trade was going on, far more people from Africa were stolen by their neighbors in Africa and sold to the Arab slave trade. Why don't they know this? Nobody tells them this. I don't think one in a, one in a million Americans uh, know this fact. So particularly young Americans are being encouraged to take their own history out of context. And as a result, to think that their own history is uniquely and especially bad. And this is a very interesting change, Will, that has gone on in our lifetimes. See, I think we were both brought up still in the era where America thought well of itself, recognized it had made mistakes, recognized that people in its history had made mistakes, as who doesn't, but recognized that, broadly speaking, the American project was a positive one. I have a book on the shelf behind me, Paul Johnson's History of the American, Speaking Pe the American People, and... Paul Johnson's History of the American People was published only 20 years ago. It begins by saying, the American story is one of the great stories of humankind, perhaps the greatest. It is impossible to imagine that a mainstream history of America written in 2022 would dare to start from that premise. Everything has been turned on its head in our own lifetimes. Very swiftly, very negatively, very in a very evil way, in my view. Yes, and you're right. I did grow up, I don't know if I grew up in an age, I'm not sure what we thought as Gen Xers here in America mm. in the collective, but I certainly, within my culture, my family, and with my individual analysis, saw America as a uniquely positive advancement mm -hmm. in human civilization, the enshrinement yes. of those Enlightenment values in a founding mm -hmm. document. I honestly think that the American founding stands there with the Magna Carta and other great moments yes. in history where we said, no, there are individual rights that you are imbued with. And, mm. and codifying that were great mm. advancements in human civilization. Now, Absolutely. look, we weren't perfect. Obviously, we made – and I don't mean to make light. We made – by saying we weren't perfect, we were – less than perfect. We, we did not advance those ideals for every single member of our society. And I think it's fascinating, though, that you point out, as do I, that that doesn't make us unique within history. In fact, no. that makes us common. Now, that's not to yes. excuse our sins. It, it is to say, like you said about Marx earlier, America was a product of its time. And whether or not you're talking about Cuba mm. or Brazil or Portugal or Spain, the world was colonialist and tribalist and racist. Mm. And your explanation to me, Douglas, for why America is going through this, despite that commonality in world history, is ignorance. He said, we don't know. Mm. Americans don't grow up knowing mm. about the Arab slave trade. But here's where I would push you a slight bit. I can't imagine Brazilians know a great amount the, about the, the Arab right. slave trade, any sure. more than Americans. And yet we don't see the same thing happening in Brazil. We don't see the same thing happening yes. in Spain and in Portugal. Absolutely. Well, there's a reason, which is, as I say, the ignorance, I should have got onto this, the ignorance has something else driving it, which is people who want us to be ignorant and to take advantage of it. What do I mean by that? You just described, I, I don't like the description of, is it, well, we were never perfect. Well, I, who was? Who is? What society is perfect? Um, we live, we're human beings, we live on planet Earth. Nothing is perfect. We're not perfect. No person is perfect. Um, but there is better, and there's certainly worse, for sure. Now, in that scenario, for instance, shouldn't we think better of the societies that got rid of slavery? Shouldn't we think better of the fact that the West was unique, not because it had slavery, but because it abolished it? Should, should we not think of this as a better attainment? I would have said so. 
But you see, in America in particular today, and I say this as, a, as a, an immigrant in America, but in America today, people are, the, 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 the ignorance is taken advantage of by bad faith actors. What I mean by that is the people who want to say America has always been rotten take advantage of the ignorance. And here's the follow-on problem. American peoples, and I would say the Western peoples, are uniquely kind in the face of this. Most people would not be. I would say that if you went to most countries in the world and said, you know, uh, we're going to completely change all of your fundamentals. We're going to say that you were born terrible, that you don't have any heroes. Nobody in your past was good. You don't have a culture worth celebrating. In fact, there's nothing good in it. In fact, it would be better for the whole world if you'd never been born. I don't think most people in the world would react well to you. If I was to go to Nigeria now and say, look, you guys in the, um, you know, 200 years ago, you were slaving like mad. You were selling your brother and sister Africans. And as a result, I'm afraid I've got to tell you, you're all born evil. I don't think I'd be much welcomed in Nigeria on my next visit. <laughs> but Americans, yeah. Americans do tolerate this. The peoples of the West have tolerated this rather too much, in my own view, rather too much. You know, Douglas, now you're touching on something that I think is the differentiating factor and why you don't see this in France or in Spain or in Brazil. And for better or worse, America started out as somewhat of a blank slate. Now, that is not mm. entirely true. There were cultural values imbued within the people mm. who founded the United States of America. But being the opened armed immigrant country that we are, it was less it was more of a open book. It was a culture capable of being defined. And what and I'm just mm. thinking out loud with you here on this, but you know, I look and there is a cultural supremacy to most civilizations. The South Koreans certainly yeah. think that is a culture that is superior to its neighbors. The Japanese mm -hmm. think similarly for their culture. I would yes. have to assume, and this is where I'm over my skis a little bit, I've read and done research on the Korean cultural supremacy. But I would have mm. to think in Italy and in Spain and in Portugal, there's a cultural pride in being Portuguese. And yes. I, I think that in America, you know, we're taught supremacy, cultural, certainly racial, and I would agree with any type of racial supremacy, but cultural supremacy is evil. We're taught mm. not to feel better about ourselves mm. than we would about other people in the world. Yeah. And we're taught that American exceptionalism is a falsehood. That's right. Yes, uh, it's, and again, this, this has happened in a generation. Uh, American exceptionalism was pretty much recognized because it was a statement of fact until quite recently. America was exceptional in so many ways. Now, again, it's, it's inverted. Now, here's the thing. The interesting thing is that I think that this is partly, again, playing on our own decency. Um, uh, we accept these criticisms because actually in the West, we accept self-criticism and we accept criticism of other people of ourselves. We forever say in America, you know, it's an imperfect union, but we, 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 we seek always to do better. And there's several things about that. One, it's a very attractive trait. But there is a tipping point between self-criticism that is useful and self-hatred that is annihilating. And I believe that when people say to us in the West, you know, there's nothing good about you. You're born evil. This is self-annihilating. This is not self-criticism. If people say this is what you could do to improve, uh, that, that, sure, I'd listen to that. But we are uniquely bad at differentiating between these two things. And, and America in particular now has that coming at it, has had this coming at it for a while. And here's, here's the follow-on problem from that. We can all see that it's nonsense. Why do I say that? Two things, just put straight out there. What's the number one destination for migrants in the world? America. The United States of America. Right. So why would that be? Is it possible that America's done anything right? Well, the footfall suggests... The footfall suggests you don't see people when millions of people come across the southern borders every year illegally. They don't bump into millions of Texans trying to make their way to Venezuela for a happier life. You know, there must be something going well here. So the footfall should tell us something. The second thing is, uh, and, and this is really uh, important in the context of the American debate, um, American history is what got us here. 
we aren't good at the moment or desirable at the moment simply by chance. It's because people before us have done things that must have been good. In other words, uh, as Branch Rickey said, luck is the residue of design. This isn't just luck we have in America or luck we have in the West. It's a product of what has got us here. It's men and women before us making good decisions. And, and that, is a, that is something that for some reason we, we know, but we don't want to accept. And I'll just give you one other quick example of that, if I may, which is we know that there are things in the Western method that work. They're, they, they're good not because white people came up with them, that, that awful type of person, the dead white male. It's not because the dead white males came up with them, it's good. But for instance, the Western scientific method works. We know that when, for instance, we need a vaccine for a global pandemic, we do not go to the Aboriginal tribes to ask them for their wisdom on medicine. And I'm not being rude. I'm not being uh, attacking of these people. I'm simply saying, as evidence, we know it. The Western scientific method works. So we know that these, the, the, these, these things are true, but we've been stuck in a sort of period of courtesy. We know that, as it were, West is best, which is why the, where the world wants to come here and why most people want to stay here. I mean, people always say in different election cycles are going to leave the country if this guy becomes president, they tend to stay. Uh, we know West is best, and yet we don't want to say it because we want to be polite to other peoples and not look like we're being supremacists. I want to come back to that thought experiment you just offered us about the mm. vaccine and whether or not we go to Aboriginal tribes or we go to the West to solve a global pandemic. I'm going to mm. come back to that thought experiment in just a moment. But I want to respond to what you said. First of all, I do love the thought experiment. It is my favorite of if all international borders were dropped, where would the biggest net migration pattern flow? Yes. It Absolutely. cuts through all the BS. In the end, yeah. that experiment, that thought experiment is the end of the argument and the end yeah, of the yeah, debate. Yeah. It, is, so. it, is the, um, it is a hypothetical that we know how it would play out in real life. But I want yeah. to play devil's advocate because I know what your detractors would say in response to this. First of all, they would point largely to some element of luck, which is not worth defining or worth debating because you just dispatched with that, I think, fairly judiciously. The other thing they would say to you, Douglas, is, well, the wealth of the West and the – trappings of the West they've built on top of that wealth is based upon pillaging and colonialism. It is scraping mm -hmm. the world's resources from Africa or from whatever it may be mm -hmm. and dragging it all back to these shores to build yourself the city on the hill. Mm -hmm. You have, in this essence, pillaged and raped and stolen your way to the preeminent place on Earth. And you say what to that detractor? <laughs> I wonder if they know anything about history. I mean, the history of the world. Um, if you're going to start worrying about uh, things created by slaves, I mean, you ought to go to Egypt and start to pull the pyramids apart. I'm sorry to break the news that the pharaohs did not give us fair day's pay for a fair day's labor. Uh, if you're worried about the products of slavery, you're going to have to go to Athens and pull down the Parthenon because uh, Alcibiades did not drag those stones to the top himself. Um, all of history is about people acquiring wealth. Some of it is self-earned. Um, some of it is stolen. Some of it is acquired. Some of it is going to be acquired on the backs of others, for sure. But much of it is going to be acquired on your own backs. Uh, in the case of America, the idea that uh, slaves built America is partly true, by no means the truth. Uh, Americans as a whole built America. It was not one group that built it. Uh, um, slaves formed obviously a minority uh, and uh, descendants form a minority today. Um, to claim that all American history is, is, uh, owes itself to the slaves is, is wildly historical. Um, and, and I'd add one other thing. It's the same thing with my own country of birth, Great Britain. Uh, Great Britain benefited from the slave trade, uh, benefited from the era of colonialism. Uh, but it's actually been estimated that Britain spent more, lost more, in abolishing the slave trade by policing the high seas for decades after we abolished it ourselves in Britain uh, and stopped the Brazilians and others trading slaves across the Atlantic. That, that Britain actually cost us more to abolish slavery 
pay off the slave owners and much more. It cost us more than we gained through the trade. Uh, in fact, Britain only stopped paying off its debt, literally its debt, about five or six years ago. Uh, so th th this was an incredible, it was an incredibly costly thing to abolish slavery for both well, Britain and America. And the yeah, people and who pretend that we only benefited from it never take this into account. Well, I would also add that it's not the differentiating factor in our preeminence in technology innovation and no, no. existing at the height of civilization. We, we Again, got rid, and we got rid out, of this 200 years ago. And the Arab I mean, slave trade continued and Brazil had slaves. And we talked about it and, throughout the world. Slavery and, there are 40 and colonialism in this was par for the course. Therefore, yes. it's not the differentiating factor that made America uniquely exceptional. No. And, you know, there are 40 million slaves estimated to be in the, uh, in the world today. Four zero million, which is more than there were in the 19th century. Um, you know, is that an interesting factor to anyone? It's an interesting factor to me. But again, your anti-racist, anti-slavery activists in America don't seem to give a damn about that. Well, I can hear New York City in the background of your apartment. That was, that was a driver agreeing with that point. That was a... I know that you are a, by the way, congratulations, you are a new, um, I don't know if you've achieved citizenship, but you are a new resident no. of the United States yeah. of America. And I love your love for america even with your criticism of america being an exporter of this world poison of woke mm -hmm. ideology um okay for many it feels like all this stuff cropped up overnight it feels like the last mm. two years and it's become a yeah, yeah, yeah. douglas over the last two years but you know when we were talking about what makes america different in its self-hatred from the other western civilizations mm. or enlightenment civilizations i was kind of listening to hear if you would bring up academia because i know it's a big part of your analysis and this is where mm. it dovetails with our mutual friend pete hegseth's mm. research he has a new book out the miseducation of america mm. and the truth is i believe and i think you share this view this isn't something that has happened overnight this isn't something that simply flows in the wake of george floyd That's this right. isn't a two-year national navel gazing experiment this has been mm. baking in the cake for decades yes that's absolutely right i mean it started off in the 60s and 70s uh, i traced the origins of this uh, i'm always slightly wary about talking about academia too much because i think academics like writers and intellectuals can overemphasize their own importance uh, for most of us we imbibe this as though in the water these days you know most Americans do not need to know, certainly shouldn't know, I know what a couple of mad lunatics at Berkeley are doing. But this does, this stuff does have a trickle down effect. There's no doubt about that. So what happens in academia has spilled out in recent decades. Um, you know, as Andrew Sullivan famously said, we all live on campus now. Um, and, and so there is a considerable truth in that, but here's some more important thing in a way. Um, the popular culture has imbibed deeply cultural revolutionary ideas and they were lying in wait for the right moment and i would say that the aftermath of the death of george floyd was the right moment for them to be pushed through everything through sport through academia through all government departments through the democrat primaries with all of the contenders uh, saying that they were going to look into reparations, for instance, through uh, CNN uh, saying before Independence Day weekend in 2020 that the president is going to speak at M Mount Rushmore this evening, kicking off Independence Day weekend by standing in front of images of two slavers standing on stolen land. So that kind of extreme rhetoric came up very recently. Even five years ago, CNN wouldn't have said that Mount Rushmore just showed a couple of slavers and that it was stolen land. You know, so this stuff came very fast. And here's, here, however, is the important and interesting and rather positive thing. The critical race theory, which is an element of what we're talking about here, which, which as you say, Pete and others have, have written about and spoken about. The critical race theory uh, started in American academia and has tried to be pushed on the American public. Here's the good news. Its first meeting with the public has not gone well. Um, they were working away on this theory in academia where, for instance, white people had to be said to be born into complete sin and everyone else is born into innocence. The only bad people are the white people. Everybody else is, is good. They've been working on this and 
when they tried, when they introduced it to schools and things, they met their great opponent, which was American parents. The American parents said no. This theory doesn't work. Why does the theory not work? Because it involves telling my child or my child's friend that because of the colour of their skin, they're evil. Now, the wizards at Berkeley and elsewhere hadn't really thought about that. It meant saying that children are bad because of the colour of their skin. So I'm actually quite positive about some of this because I think that whenever a theory so swiftly meets the public and, and the public push it back so strongly, then there's hope. And there is considerable hope in America on this. And the hope is the American public. And that, that response by the American public is in no small measure through the work of a guy named Chris Rufo, who works yes, at the Manhattan course. Institute and, and City Journal. And that takes me back to this thought experiment you brought up a moment ago. Well, you brought up, where do we turn when we're looking for a vaccine to a worldwide pandemic? We don't turn to Aboriginal cultures. We turn to the West. So I want to now, I want to ask you about, I heard you say this, I believe in an interview with um, Gerard Butler at the Wall Street Journal. And I found it fascinating. Mm -hmm. You talked about this moment where Chris Rufo had an encounter with Mark Lamont Hill. You said mm -hmm. in the interview that you know Mark Lamont Hill, as do I. And throughout the last several years, I would have described Mark as a friend at times, despite his very mm. radical ideas. And I would tell Mark that mm -hmm. to his face. And I think you have similar compliments in that mm. Mark is a smart guy. Mark yeah. and I are diametrically, philosophically opposed to one another. Um, mm. However, there was this moment where Mark said to Chris Rufo, here's what I like about being black. And he named all these things about black culture. And then he pushed Chris Rufo. What is it you like about being white? And you mm. said something interesting, Douglas. You said Rufo chose an option, which career-wise mm. was probably the right option, wherein he said, I don't think of myself that way. I don't go about defining myself that way, mm. which, by the way, I would say is accurate. If somebody asked me that yeah. question, my answer would probably thing. be similar. It's like if somebody said to me, like, what do you like about being a guy? I'd be like, right. I know. I don't really think about that. I mean, right. like, it's, it's, you know, it's not like this great sound is better. I don't think you go, you know, uh, what's it like? Who right. does that? I wouldn't know the answer to that. What do you like about yeah. being white? Because I don't walk around thinking about how great exactly. it is to be white. And I'm sure somewhere out there, there's somebody says, well, see you there. That's privilege. But um, mm. what, I, what I really was fascinated by was your second answer, which you said Rufo mm. could have chosen the nuclear option. And he mm. would, the nuclear option meaning nuke his own career, most likely, yeah. which is exactly. he could have bragged about the accomplishments of, and I think these are in your words, in essence, white culture. But white culture, I think, as defined by the extrapolations of the Anglosphere West, to take yes. this back full circle to where we started, yes. wherein he could have talked about space travel or modern medicine, mm. or as you mentioned, the scientific method. Tell me mm. more about that, because I'll be real with you, Douglas. Mm. You're not wrong, but even reading it and probably even having this conversation right now, it's somewhat uncomfortable because it feels so sure. ripe for someone to say, racist right sure no i knew that as i was writing it. and of course there's already been backlash about this passage i just urge people uh, obviously to buy the book and to read this for themselves because i think if i say to myself it's a very important question this um the the the, the question to chris rufo as you say there was one option available to him which is the one he took which said i don't like to be thinking about myself in these terms which by the way would be my answer as mine pushed pushed there's a second answer which is to say look Basically, white is like the convening point, do we? Let's just say it's like the United Nations. Like, everyone can be a member. You don't care. You know, it's not like, okay, if you want to say that white people can't become black, or whatever, fine. But look, anyone who wants to be part of what's called the white Western tradition, uh, fine. You know, we want it to be polyglot. We want it to be uh, diverse. No problem with me. In fact, it's one of our advantages, you know, as I say in the book, you know, if you or I moved to India, we'd stand no chance of getting to the top of politics. Um, uh, if, if, if we went to China, same thing, you know, in, in the West, people arrive in America, Britain, you know, we have cabinets, we have shadow cabinets filled with a diverse range of people from a bewildering array of backgrounds, and it benefits us. Um, so that's the second option. The third option, as you say, is the one that I, of course, inevitably already come in for some criticism for and some misrepresentation. I'm very careful in what I say. What I say is white people and the West are inextricable. 
uh, as you know, you might say uh, Hispanic peoples and the places they come from are inextricable. Uh, that um, Black Africans and Africa are inextricable. Chinese and China. So white people in the West is at least a Venn diagram that's got considerable crossover. So if somebody says, what do you like about being white? You can take the view that Robin D'Angelo takes in her appalling book, White Fragility, and say there's no good form of being white and it's inescapable. That's what D'Angelo says. There's no good form of being white and it is inescapable. Yeah. You could say that. However, I suggest that there is also another option, which I'm very, very loath to say, but I say in the book, which is to say, OK, here are the things that these appalling dead white people created. And I'm just going to list them at you. And you'll see, as I show in that book, this is modernity. This is the civilized modern world. It's the culture which not only follows the scientific method and the democratic method, but the human rights method, for instance. These are not the norms historically. They're not even the norms today in the world. They're Western right. norms that were gifted to us primarily by dead white people. Now, does that mean they only belong to white people? No. But should we refuse to identify this fact? I don't see why. If everybody else is going to go down this route, we can, we can say, look, we can all play that game. I'd rather not, but we could all play it. So my response, and I think this is a fascinating thought experiment that you put forward, is I don't want to play that game. And I don't think you do yeah. either. And here's no, why. No, I say that. I say right. that. And here, here's why for me, Douglas, I am not a victim of white guilt. I feel no. no white shame. Same here. On the flip side of that coin, Douglas, I feel no white pride. Absolutely. I find nothing in my race mm. that gives me any particular emotion one way or yeah. the other. And Absolutely. I would say those accomplishments. Thing. You're right. Yes. And I would say those accomplishments that you point to rightfully as the products of Western civilization. And I know you agree with this, so I'm not debating you. I'm just talking mm. this out with you. Those products of, of Western civilization are the product of ideas and not race. And they are ideas mm -hmm. available to everyone. It is well, true, as thing. you pointed out, is true, as you pointed out, the dead white men that did advance those ideas. And by the way, in, mm. in, in I guess, gratuitous form here, also some uniquely sinful ideas along the way. Actually, let sure. me admit that. I'm not sure they were uniquely sinful. They were sinful, and they were sinful sure. across the globe. But these assets, which, again, now to take this full circle, were embodied in the United States of America's founding, were unique. And mm -hmm. that shouldn't be a marker of race. That should be a marker of culture. And I think we have a lot yes. of trouble separating race from culture. Yes, we have a lot of trouble because it's not entirely possible. I mean, that just, just has to be said, as I say. I mean, can you... Um, can you separate out Chinese people from Chinese culture? You can, but it's not going to be a straightforward task. Can you separate out Japanese people from Japanese culture? You could, but it's pretty, it's pretty hard. It's the same thing with the West. Uh, and there's nothing ne inevitably bad about that. Uh, as you say, though, Will, question is, is it available for everybody? And the answer to that with the West is yes. Um, there are people in America at the moment, very high up in the teaching unions, among other places, who think that, for instance, standardized testing is racist and they want to do away with it. They think, for instance, that math is racist and they want to do away with it. They claim that there are other ways of knowing. So there is, as it were, the Western mathematical method. And then there are other ways of knowing, which is said to be a sort of indigenous voodoo of some kind. It's very strange. They never say what the workings of this are or what has, it has produced. But my point is the mathematical method is, is, is not, I mean, lots of people contributed to it, but, but it's, it's, it's not that, you know, it's been refined by white people. It's interesting. It's that it works. It works. Right. right. You couldn't build a bridge by other ways of knowing people using their other ways of knowing math and engineering. Right. Um, People around the world use the Western method of engineering. They don't use a First Nations wisdom to build a large bridge. And I would I mean, carry that further, don't. by the way, Douglas. I would say understanding that a foundational value of modern civilization is a full embrace of free speech 
isn't interesting because it was put forth by white founding fathers. It's interesting because it works. Yes, exactly. It's the same with a whole set of things. Uh, the Western democratic method, again, not normal, not normal at all. Uh, the Western system of notation in music, for instance, I mentioned at one stage in the book. Um, it's not that it was white people that came up with it that makes it uh, successful. It's that it works better than the other notation systems. Um, right. You know, I, I, I don't see why. I mean, he, and here's the thing, by the way, Will. I mean, as you, just to get back to this pride thing again. Uh, as you say, I regard this, I would like to regard all this as morally neutral. So that if in the same way, somebody said, do you have a pride in being a man? I say, no, because I had no say in it. Uh, Any more than I have pride in being white, I had no say in it. Right. But... If you say to me about your civilization, your culture, your nation, you can't feel any pride in it. Well, in that case, you shouldn't feel any shame in it either. So right. you get to choose on this one. You don't get to say you have no right to access pride, but you should feel shame. Because this is a loaded game. This is like going into the casino, perhaps the First Nations casino, and being told that the game is rigged. This I game is rigged. I understand what you're saying. And the current temperature of the United States of America and the UK and the West is for the culture and I guess the race that extends from that Western civilization is made to face its shame, but told never to face any pride. It's yes, and a it's so strange, game. isn't it, Will? It's so Will. It's so strange, Will, because in the in the, there were times in the past we could say, when, for instance, in Britain, the history of colonialism was taught in only one tone, only a thing of pride. Look how much of the world we've dominated. Okay, mm. I'm not a fan of that, but I'm right. certainly not a fan of saying the whole thing was just evil and the whole right. thing was negative. And we should only be ashamed of it any more than, again, saying the history of America. I, 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 there have maybe been times in the past when people didn't know about certain aspects of this country's history. Uh, and it's worth bringing those things to the fore. Absolutely. I wouldn't want somebody who said everything we've done has always been good. We've never made any mistakes. Equally, right. somebody who says you've never done anything good. I, right. I'm not interested in that either. I so much want to just participate in the race neutral view of values in, yeah, exactly. in history. And I hear where you're and pushing And so do this. an increasing number of black writers and others in America, by the way. It's worth pointing out. The, the new generation of, of, of black American writers and others are exactly in line with you and me on this. They want it to be race neutral. They don't like, indeed, they're very worried by. Who rightly, are you talking about? This A new re- generation of black writers. Who are you oh, referencing? I, mean, I think people like... Um, uh, Coleman Hughes, Thomas Shafton Williams, um, you know, not not so new now, but Glenn Lowry, John McWhorter. Um, mm. They don't want any part in this in this evil pitting races against each other. They want a race neutral environment as well, in which we all benefit from each other's learning and and and, and abilities and thoughts. So right. I'm quite I'm quite positive that actually. The future doesn't belong to the race hucksters and the race baiters, the Robin D'Angelo's, who's obviously white herself, or the Ibram X. Kendi's. I'm quite confident that there's enough people who want to go down the sort of race neutral line. But there's a bit of pain in the short term. And in a world where we can we can separate accomplishment and ideas from identity. That seems intuitive Mm. and easy to do. Identity beyond the Mm. individual identity, of course. Um, I have no stake. I have no claim in anything anyone did before me, whether or not they shared my skin color. It's about what I've been able to accomplish in my own life. Yes. Um, I want to go two last places with you, and I want to return to the concept of the warriors, Mm. and you just reintroduced them there with the anti-racist. And you say something very fascinating. You said at the outset of this conversation, you said they use the term justice, but what they mean is revenge. Explain. Is that your line lifted from Nietzsche um, with credit? Uh, he says it's in the genealogy of morals. Um, I, I think it's a very recognizable type. Uh, people who claim to be motivated by a search for justice, but actually, uh, when you scratch not very far below the surface, you find it's revenge. Uh, this is stated by the people I attack in this book. Ibram X. Kendi, in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, which if he lost the word anti from the title would be accurate, um, Ibram X. Kendi uh, 
um, says in his book, the answer to past oppression is present day oppression. The answer to past injustice is present day injustice. Basically, if we agree that black people were prejudiced against in the past, we should be prejudiced against white people in the present. Uh, this is hell. But it's also revenge. It's simply revenge. It's some people in the past did a bad thing to some other people. Therefore, to rectify it in the present, not even the descendants of, but let me get this absolutely accurate. People who look like people who did something bad in the past owe something to people who look like people to whom a bad thing was done. That's insane. That's insane. We're not even talking in the case of America now about descendants of slaves being owed by descendants of slavers. Like, how would you carry that process out on a practical level in America in the 21st century? Nobody is alive who can do the apologizing. Nobody is alive who could accept the apology. And again, that matters enormously because we have a spirit of vengeance in the air in America. What else is it that we've seen in the last couple of years? What else was it we saw in the iconoclasm of the summer of 2020? It was revenge. It was the pulling down of all heroes. It was the attempt to desecrate the holy places of the civilization that these people believed to be so wicked. Attacking the holy temples of America, its founding fathers, its constitution, its ideas, its history, everything. That I think you're absolutely revenge. right. I, I think you're right, Douglas. And I've talked about that here on this this podcast. It, mm. it just you don't have to scratch very deeply at all to understand no. there is a strong current of vengeance underneath this movement guised as disguised as justice. And I, I don't know. And maybe there's a hopeful tone to take, as you mentioned, the race hucksters are not the visionaries of the future. I don't no. know that most of America truly understands the extent of this desire for mm. revenge. I don't know mm. that they realize when you when you leave behind the word equality and embrace the word equity, fully what you are embracing. Yeah. I don't think most of America knows we're not just moving towards a world where everybody gets a chance and everybody is treated equally. We're actually embracing a movement right now where in order for one to rise, someone else must fall. In order yes, for one to right. be lifted, someone else must be pushed down. Yeah, zero-sum game. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, that's absolutely the case. By the way, that happens on other areas of American life and Western life. You know, as I wrote in my last book, The Madness of Crowds, you know, there was always a type of feminist who believed that women didn't need equality but needed to be better than, you know? the sort of insane fourth wave feminists who ended up saying things like, we don't need men, <laughs> you know, right. men are awful. Uh, you know, if the suffragettes had said that, I, women might not have the vote still. I mean, it's an incredibly unattractive position to argue from. In the same way, there are some people on the race issue who say, you know, we don't want to be equal. We want to be better than. Uh, the head of the Black Lives Matter movement in Britain, in Oxford, as it happens, who sadly, since uh, she came to fame, was uh, shot in the head and hospitalized by a black gang member in South London. But the head of BLM Oxford actually said once in a tweet, we don't want equality, we want to make the white people our slaves. Mm. Go, well, that's, that's not justice, that's just revenge. Just revenge. Well, I was laughing. And, I don't, and I'm not up for that, and I don't know almost anybody else who is. Right. Because I'm not paying that. I, I, we've paid that down. We paid down any moral debt we owe. We actually paid down the financial debt as well. Nobody born in, 20, in the 2020s, nobody born in the late 20th century owes anyone else anything. We don't owe because we didn't do anything. And this I was laughing whole when you concept brought up. Of hered the whole concept of hereditary guilt is just obscene. Yeah. Um, I was laughing when you brought up fourth wave fem feminism because they got checkmated throughout the last five years. All that it took yeah. was for men to declare themselves women and, it, and undercut the entire yes. enterprise. <laughs> uh, uh, finally, I want to end with this, and, and that is, let's, let's just go one layer deep on the equity angle, and that is, mm. as you mentioned, there's two warriors in this war. That is the anti-racist, and then there is the Marxist. And, I, and I am, I'm interested in how much that Venn diagram overlaps, because I do mm. think as a motivational factor, you're right, revenge is a massive part of it. I don't know where that revenge overlaps with communism. But let's start with mm. this. Let's start with what you said about 
Marks. First of all, is it Marx? I know that the Soviet Union is the most famous implementation of his ideas. He was a German. Wouldn't that be the West? So wouldn't he fall under the same scrutiny as the rest of the West? Yes, that's I mean, such an interesting point. I make this point in the book about the post-colonial period. Something very weird um, happened in the post-colonial period. The main, the main theorists of post-colonialism, people like the person I wrote about in the book, Franz Fanon, um, uh, you would have thought that in the post-colonial period, these people might have said, uh, n when the British have left or the other European powers have left, when they've left, we should return to a pre-colonial world. Uh, so, you know, in Nigeria, maybe you could go back to having the Oprah of Benin running slave markets, for instance, or whatever. We could go to, back to our traditions, um, positive or negative or both. Uh, that wasn't what happened. In the post-colonial period, people like Fanon, backed up by Sartre and others, said, you've just managed to overthrow Western colonialism, and that is why we can now offer you Western Marxism. <laughs> strange, strange. Uh, 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 these were um, local movements very often of people who thought, yes, the answer to, to, to the post-colonial period in Africa and elsewhere was Marxism. Well. You know, this actually has a serious impact in the modern day, because if we look around the world, the countries that are now still moaning about colonialism are the ones that just haven't worked very well since. Uh, you don't hear Singapore uh, crying for reparations because of colonialism. Nowhere that worked, nowhere that's worked amazingly well, talks about reparations or owing of debt or anything else. It's only the countries that haven't worked that well. You know, it's only people like Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe who, you know, endlessly talked about the need for the European countries to pay uh, reparations for the colonial period. Why? Well, because Robert Mugabe found it very useful to cover over his own theft of his country's resources and his own inept uh, rule that led to the average of Zimbabwean lifespan halving during his presidency. It's only because of that that, that the, the white Westerner was a very useful target to cover over his own evil. Um, the places that failed did that sort of thing. The places that succeeded didn't. There should be something we learned from that. But why, as you point out earlier, that Marx has his own ugly histi history with racism and mm. Marx himself, as we pointed out, being a child of the West, why mm. has Marx escaped this same level of scrutiny in the West? Why has well, he been people, exempted from this anti-racist movement? Because the people um, destroying all of our pasts know that they need him. You see, they don't need Thomas Jefferson. They don't want Thomas Jefferson. They don't need Immanuel Kant. They don't need uh, Voltaire or uh, uh, David Hume. They don't need Abraham Lincoln. They don't need Winston Churchill. They want to attack all of these people. How do they, they need Marx? They don't like them. Because they need the veneer of communism to justify the revenge? They need that Why going do they need forward. Marx? They, they need communism going forward. They need the Marxism going forward. They know that's going to be useful to them. Whereas by comparison, the history of the West is not useful to them because they want to pull that down. Uh, right. They want to take away the, all of that. That's why they take away our heroes. That's why I can't stress enough. One of the first manifestations of the war in the West is the war on all of our heroes, all the people we were brought up to look up to, all the people we should look up to, all the remarkable men and women who made our society and our civilization. Wait, Douglas, tell me if you disagree with this. So mm. the need of the anti-racist for the communist hero and the communist ideology isn't necessarily because they are devout communists. We know no. Patrice Cullors, the founder of BLM, or the, the head mm -hmm. of BLM in the United States of America, was using BLM funds to buy mansions. She's not a very devoted she, she, communist. She, she, yes, she could be a communist. She's not a very devout one, I think. We know okay, <laughs> well, which only makes her, right, Douglas, a really good communist, because that's the history of communism yes, in implementation absolutely. throughout the world. So in other words, absolutely. communism becomes the necessary vehicle because all it's ever really mm. been is not a utopic egalitarian society. All communism mm. has been is a different way to distribute power, one that is that's based right. upon force and belonging to the party. And in this case, the anti-racism movement is the party and communism is the vehicle for power. That's right. That's absolutely right. Um, 
you know, also, I should just stress, I mean, again, on what you, the point you just importantly made, not everyone who's doing this knows they're being a communist. Um, look at the left in the last 50 years in America or anywhere in, in the West. Look at the critiques of America and the West in the last 50 years. Whenever you ask any anti-American, well, where is it working? I mean, they always noticed they, that they always had the same crappy fallback options. They said things like, well, have you seen the um, healthcare system in Cuba? Hmm. Yes. Um, or have you seen the educational achievements in Venezuela? Hmm. You could always tell from the places they thought were good what they actually wanted to happen here. In hmm. the same way, by the, and we'd recognize that anywhere. I mean, you've seen these recent ridiculous attacks on Elon Musk uh, for having the crime of having been born up, born and brought up in apartheid uh, South Africa. And despite his parents being anti-apartheid people, you know, they sort of he's been attacked. With. But imagine if imagine if every time somebody said to Elon Musk, for want of a better example, you know, um, whenever he made a critique of America, let's say he did. And if somebody said, well, where do you think, you know, this has worked? If he said, well, it was really good in apartheid South Africa. You'd go, hmm, something funny going on here. Mm. Well, something funny going on here with the leftists who always admire the societies that tried the rubbishy, disastrous Marxist experiment and still look to them today. You know, they never say, almost never say, uh, that we should improve ourselves by looking to another capitalist society. Almost never. <laughs> All right. Well, War on the West, How to Prevail in an Age of Unreason by Douglas Murray. Go check the book out. Douglas, I always love talking to you, and I really appreciate you giving me so much of your time today. No, it's been a great pleasure, Will. Thank you. And thank you to all of your listeners. I can't wait to hear back from uh, your uh, viewers and listeners as well. That's part of the joy of this book is knowing that I'm, I'm giving the weapons, the ammunition to people to fight back in a culture war, to know what to say, to know the reasons to know the arguments, uh, to see what they're up against, and to win in pushing this back. And one of the best things, if I can say so, since the book has come out and a terrific reception, is the number of American parents and others who've said to me in the street and by email and my message and elsewhere, you've given me the tools I need to argue with my kids. No, and, no. I think that's hopeful. I think that's hopeful. I hope And that sometimes helps. the kids say, you've given me the arms and the tools I need to argue with my parents or my There's professors, and that's just as good. There's the hope. All right, Douglas Murray, thank you. Great pleasure. Thanks. For